silence and sound, wind and stillness, light and dark, the hidden, the revealed, the movement out, the movement in, heaven and earth, male, female, water and fire, the deepest interiority, the furthest expanse, the place of this and that, of either and or. To continue our blessing at this time of the autumnal equinox, we continue to celebrate this mystery of the union of opposites, the sacred marriage, which we've been talking about now for these all of these days, really the spiraling in, the spiraling out, the spiraling up, the spiraling down. This movement, this du dualistic movement, which uh, engages, obviously, and marks not only our body in terms of uh, gravity, we are gravitationally between the two poles, and all of our life and all of our creativity is, uh, is based on on that gravitational force. So this morning, when we start our slides, we're going to speak of this mystery, this, this polarity, this duality. We're going to speak of this in terms of the sacred marriage. And this, again, is a theme I've touched on off and on for days. But today, we're really going to concentrate on this. We, as women, Absorbing, containing, housing, in balance, always with the energy that leads to our sacred marriage. However you wish to think about this, as the container for fire, as the water which receives fire and indeed engulfs fire, however you yourself, uh, most of you probably, are women who have had husbands, male companions. Others of you, like me, have lived and chosen to live solitary lives for whatever reason. So that we especially have had to work through this mystery of the sacred marriage in a different kind of way. Because for me, it is the internalization in my shamanic work which brings me the fire and in my own imagination, I think of this as the union of fire and water within my very being. And one, each can destroy each other. Together, they meet and give way to each other in a creative way. So we will be looking at images of the sacred marriage, beginning with at least one, if not several images from the great temples in India. The one, the one place in the world in terms of art, art history, the history of architecture, has celebrated this divine sacred union in sculpture, some of the mo most blissfully beautiful sculpture that's ever been created. And we'll move through that, those images of uh, polarity and talk about sacred marriage and talk about the sacred marriage indeed in relationship to the in, the final vision. And also today I want to briefly touch on the theme, one of the themes most important in my own life and has been since I've been a child, the mystery of sacred animals. And I wish so much that uh, I was able to spend more time on this theme. 
And in fact, when I first started doing this, I devoted one entire day to the sacred animals. This is how important this theme is to me. But very gradually, I became to understand that this was not nourishing most people. So I had to let it go because obviously this work isn't about me, it's about you and you who come to, to learn from my experiences. So now the sacred, the sacred animals I are just here on the last day and I present only a few to you, the few which um, uh, are the most important animals to me. And finally, images that I simply refer to as images of bliss, the final vision. I, let's open the circle now to your stories, your thoughts on yesterday, uh, experiences last night, your dreams, in every way. Please, um, let's move into the day with our storytelling. The, um, I don't think I had dreams last night, but what happened was I, I would keep waking up in your studio with the memory of your studio. And it's like that happened all through the night. And it's just like yesterday going into your studio was just like, oh, I, I, it was incredible for me because I could feel the energy of the creative energy. I could feel like the sacred animals. It was just so full of life. And, um, Afterwards, after everybody left, Barbara and I stayed. And then I left and left Barbara in there alone. And then when I saw her come back, I went back. And I just sat there because it's like obvious to me. I feel like there's energy in there that I want to just sit with and see what happens. But um, one of the things that I saw, I won't say that, but one of the things that happened to me yesterday, I saw Crow Mother and um, the painting, and I love the painting, the charcoal. And so I went home last night and it's like, I want a dream. I mean, should I get this or shouldn't I get this? You know, because I'm trying to not to be a consumer. I want to be, buy what's, a, what's important for me, for my soul. So I'm going, and I didn't dream of Crow Mother last night. So I got up this morning and I'm in the bathroom and I just thought, well, okay, am I supposed to get this or not? And then all of a sudden, it's just like my heart started just like this energy in my heart. You know, it's just like, it's like, okay. So it's like, I'm going, I would, if she's still available, I'd like to buy Crow Mother. <laughs> and I, and, and um, my sweetheart, he gave me, he was going to buy me a uh, birthday present, and he had already decided what he was going to get and all that. And so I just said, last night I said, well, if I decide to get it, can you give me my birthday present money? <laughs> <laughs> so I have the first installment in my purse if it's still available. <laughs> you know, it's just like, oh my God. Oh. Well, I love it that your sweetheart is buying from other laying her magic eggs in your life. Yes. <laughs> what I love about that is the eggs start getting darker and darker inside until finally when the ones that she, the ones that are lying on the ground, she's, you know, between her legs, and it's great. And, uh, I, I do, that's, I love that, I love that drawing. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, Colleen was asking me if this is going to be a period of this winter. Winter is always my fiercest creative work. I really, um, I get very few people, I, you know, it's summer, people move through New Mexico for obvious reasons. I don't get many visitors and I do not really welcome visitors uh, very much during the winter. It's my most intense uh, creative time and the fire has a lot to do with that. Feeding the fire, working right next to the fire, I move my bench so that it's right there by the fire. The fire is here, the painting is here, the charcoal, whatever it is. But I want to, um, I'm feeling that more and more the need to get back into charcoal for a while. 
So I'm not sure yet. I, I won't know until I start working whether I will be working, doing more charcoals, or if I will, um, uh, if I will continue. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it doesn't matter what the medium is. On the other hand, the medium does. The imagery is obviously affected by the medium. Charcoal imagery looks different than uh, something that's painted because uh, you have no tools. The thing about charcoal is it's immediate. It's just a gob of black stuff in your fingers. And the work itself is smeared with my fingers. I mean, it, it's, so it's an entirely different, and it, it's, it's just, and it's also work that I stand over. So the movement is like this. I'm on my feet the whole time. Whereas the painting, I'm sitting at a bench, like, like you're sitting at benches, you know, painting. So yes, if any of you in the course of the afternoon want to spend time over there, I'll, I'll put things back out again, and um, um, the, the space is yours. something really special to me um, and I had sort of a new um, image of this whole thing um, oh. as a result of this week um, I lived with my grandmother um, until I was 10 years old essentially and um, she was such an incredible spirit and in the very early years we lived in a carriage house out on this estate and um, and there were you know, animals all around, and we fed every cat that, you know, came to the door, and um, there were rabbits that, you know, we befriended, and uh, there were even horses. You could go for a sleigh ride in, uh, in the snow in this little sleigh with horses, and it was, um, you know, a really neat place. But one of the best parts was my grandmother uh, loved to garden, and she had a fabulous, um, vegetable garden and uh, this was a picture taken with her and um, it's down in the garden and um, I just had the, the sense that she was the great corn mother um, uh, from being here beautiful, this week. Beautiful. Um, Gosh what a young grandmother you had. I know. I, I, she was young. Yeah. And that was. Very and you were how old? Too. About three, two, um, two yeah, or three. Yeah, I was about three here. Okay. I think, okay. Um, between two and three. And. Um, and her, her name? name? Her name was Isabel. Mm. And most beautiful of Isis. That's what that name means, Isabel. Beautiful Isis. Really. The beautiful oh. great mother. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, in addition to all this, just to, she was in the Ezekiel Follies. I just love this about her too. <laughs> For a few years, she and her sister. Had a, uh, she and her sister had a, a dancing and singing act, and she was extremely creative and, you know, played the piano and danced and, and drew and, you know, it was just such fun to be with her. But anyway, um, I just felt like sharing this because she's just, uh, she's uh, the inspiration for my life, really. So. We're in the corn. That's so good. That is so gorgeous. Oh, that's gorgeous. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. All right. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Indeed. Thank you. Isabella. Isabel is beautiful Isis. That's what beautiful the word. Isis. It's an ancient, ancient name. And what's Isis an animal? I, her animal. Um, she's not associated with an animal. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah. But her name means throne, and that's what your grandmother is. You are enthroned in her arms. Right. Mm -hmm. So she's the great throne. She's the beautiful throne. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pretty powerful. It you is. didn't know you had it an really icon is. in your arms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. An icon of the beautiful mother yeah. holding the divine child. Wow. Oh. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's really, that is powerful. Wow. That's a little hard to quite accept, but I'll think about that one. Well, <laughs> she is now. 
I mean, she's your, she's the object of your devotion, your memory, all of those things that we associate with praying to the Great Spirit. Images of androgyny are not easy to look at sometimes because, in fact, we know in our minds that, uh, for instance, a half an orange and a half an apple are not a whole piece of fruit. And so this mystery of the union of heaven and earth, of male-female, of divine human, all of the polarity imagery we we did this uh, in, in the kind of litany I threw out this morning, verbal litany. Here now let's look at some of the images of that verbal litany. This is one of the rapturously beautiful images in a, one of the temples in India. The union of um, Shiva and his consort Parvati. So again, we know that the the right side, and the right side is always associated with masculine energy. The right side, Shiva's, and the, the other side, the left side, as, as the, these divine uh, god goddesses face us. In fact, this does not exist in nature and therefore sets up a conundrum for the mind even as we look at it. And yet these, uh, these images, as I say, in these temples, I, I've never been to India, so I'm talking now only mm -hmm. out of, uh, you know, what I've observed in, in art books, um, well, all my life, really. The understanding of physical, of, of, uh, of in, the, in the animal kingdom, and in, in, our, in our bodies, we, we, we are part, obviously, of that animal kingdom. We only have a more sophisticated nervous system uh, controlled by a larger brain so that our coupling, uh, the sexual coupling as, as the metaphor for spiritual coupling, spiritual enlightenment, is as old as can be. It's just that by the time we, we come to the, uh, the hundreds of years of these rapturously beautiful sculptures in India, it is of course has been around, it's a concept that's been around for a long time. And from this sexual coupling, in other words, from our own, because everything we know, we know through our senses. Therefore, we, everything we know outside of our physical, bodily, carnal, carnal in the sense of our very beautiful fleshliness, uh, we know and we overlay on our world so that we understand the relationship between what we've already talked about the first day. When you, when you bury a seed, which is the masculine principle, you get a female plant, which in fact contains of its very nature more of the, of, of the masculine principle. So that the female tree, the female stalk, the female anything in nature uh, contains not only images of itself, female properties, but carries inside the mystery of the other. And this understanding of the mystery of the other is one of our aboriginal understandings of the Godhead, of spirituality. That God is not, the spirit world is not only interior, the interiority of the spirit in our soul, the spirit world is also out there. So this understanding of something other than out there and something deeply intimate in here is again one of these great duality, the energy of this great system of duality which, which, which life on earth is all about. So let's, um, let's look at some of these and I, I, I give them to you just as visual meditations on the theme which we talked about in the circle this morning, and uh, so now let's look. Now this is a highly complex one, but they can be as simple as um, a ritual pole like this. This is a Nigerian uh, ritual pole, probably um, um, 
a, a ritual object used in, uh, in a, a marital ceremony of some kind. The dark, dark woman's side of the, of, of the, of the carving at the very uh, top, the, the head of the pole, so to speak. And the opposite, the, the figure of light. Light always associated, light and brightness always associated with the sun and with the masculine. Um, the female, and again I keep repeating this, always associated with the Chthonic earth, the, the richness. Uh, black is, has always been, from the beginning of time, the most sacred color because it is the color of per fertility. Um, and in fact, uh, in many societies all over the world, I would say possibly even most, the sign of mourning isn't black, it's white. So that it's uh, associated with, with afterlife as, as, uh, as, as light and vision in, in relationship to uh, the darkness of the earth. But this of course varies from a tribe to tribe all over the world. And sometimes they overlap and are the same, and sometimes they're just the opposite, which of course is as it could be. This is a very simple etching uh, that I found reproduced on an ordinary note card the last time I was at the British Museum. And it, when I saw it, it, it was uh, again just a startling uh, relationship of, um, uh, of, of, of this mystery we've been talking about. And and obviously the card, uh, the, the card can be reversed so that we can have uh, a black sky and the light down here or the darkness down here and, and the light above. But this union, this sitting side by side of both principles, one containing the other. The beauty of, of the simplicity of this abstract, these two abstract shapes. Uh, another image I just tore out of a magazine. The dark burning in the brightness and the, the brightness burning in darkness. And in this part of the Earl, uh, uh, world and uh, uh, among the Navajo people, this beautiful, beautiful image of the night sky and um, and earth. The grandfather night and grandmother day. And the creatures of night, all of the constellations in the night sky, the starry night sky, and the creatures of, uh, of day, this, this, uh, this, this great uh, womb that produces growth. This is the center of her belly, so to speak, the great, uh, the great mother earth's belly. And from this place where the seed is planted, the energy goes down in the root and equally rises up into the corn stalk. This is the tree of life uh, for the Native American peoples. Grandmother Earth and Grandfather Sky. A beautiful uh, colored woodcut from about the 1950s um, this beautiful dance of uh, a man and a woman, sort of at the edge of the world kind of experience. It's not unlike the Weichel images where the stars above were the same as the flowers below. Again, that relationship. Uh, the stars as flowers in the great night sky, the flowers as the, the flowers, um, as the shapes on earth and how the flowers themselves, uh, the stars and the flowers, are both in the man and, and, and the woman, who start off uh, doing this dance of life together and end up uh, completely merged into each other as the, as the union of the energy of the above and the below, of night and day, of heat and, and, um, heat and ice, so to speak, uh, fire and water come together. Isn't it beautiful? And a few of my own images, which I was, I was asked to do um, eight images to uh, be included in a, a new translation of the Song of Songs by a professor at uh, Notre Dame University in Indiana. 
and um, so these are f eight of my meditations on um, um, uh, he just chose or actually I chose and he approved um, the, the, the texts uh, which text to uh, to choose to to illustrate the mystery of divine of uh, human love uh, always uh, in relationship to the mystery of um, divine love so that the language the beautiful language of the uh, the song of songs uh, of course can be read at the level of the the souls uh, uh, embrace and in this case the man's soul uh, em embraced um, by the same divine love implying that divine love is is also male female is also androgynous this will be the same size as the the crow mother that Belinda is speaking of these were all done in the same size sheets of paper and many of them were about this dialogue between crumb mother and the dog god and I think I showed you one the first day uh, they're they're always side usually side by side uh, facing each other in this sort of um, their with their eyes focused on each other Sometimes uh, their arms, their hands come together, but very often it's usually the feet that come together. Not so much in this one because uh, the dog god's uh, foot is down here and her claw is raised up, but very often they, they sit side by side. I, I, don't, I can't remember how many I've, if I've brought a number of these today or not. It doesn't, anyway, we'll just talk about this one. And very often, not always in, in, in the drawings, but very often I appear in the middle of them, sort of in the middle of this energy. Um, and in this one, I appear, and this, um, this dark form started growing out of me, and then it turned into this huge moth. And of course, we know that the uh, uh, moths and um, butterflies especially are associated with uh, resurrection rebirth. So that when this uh, drawing was finished and I was myself studying it, because very often, uh, well, I mean, it, it's usually when I, I'm making a drawing, I don't know what's happening. I don't know what the content is. It's only toward the end that I think, oh, I mean, what I'm saying is that the, the work surprises me in terms of knowing. I don't set out knowing uh, what, what's going to appear. It appears and then I know it. Um, but this, I've always been um, mad for moths. There's a period at the end of summer where we're invaded uh, on six different, uh, we have, we have a, a rotation of six um, appearances and then death, appearance, death, appearance, death of, of six different kinds of moths late summer and into autumn in New Mexico. And I'm simply mad for these moths. Some of them are huge and they're all, I have always found moths, moths much more beautiful than butterflies myself. And, of course, it's still hot in New Mexico at that time of the year. So in the evening, I'm sitting on the porch reading. And, of course, uh, even though it's a screen porch, they're drawn to the light that, um, that I'm, you know, my reading light on the lamp, on, on my reading lamp on the porch. And the, the, the screen can just be covered with them. And then I take a flashlight and just study the, 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 their bellies, so to speak, and the patterns of the wings. Um, so I, I was quite excited when this moth got into this drawing. You were You're pregnant. Pregnant. Uh, no. Well. Uh, uh, well, I. I don't remember that. Um, I also have no arms. My arms end at my elbows. Yeah. So I. I, and this again is this embryonic, uh, the way I very often, if, if I'm in, and I'm rarely in my, my own paint, my own imagery, but when I am, I'm there in a kind of truncated, like in the, in the place of constant regeneration myself. I'm only half formed. And implying that the energy of which I'm partaking is what will complete me, so to speak. But I, yes, yes, well, that's good. That's good. <laughs> um, this is another from that series. It's a little bit different. It's Crow Mother and the Dog God. It's called Arrival and, um, let's see, 
what do I call this one? Uh, journey and arrival. So here is the dog god, always in a place of journeying, always on the move. We've only, it's one of the energies we love about being with sage. Uh, periods of rest, but then always on the move. Uh, seeking, finding, bearing, uh, active. Spreading the energies on the face of the earth. Crow mother arriving from the above. So this is the, the arrival containing the journey, which in itself is a dichotomy. But her, her, uh, her face in this one looks not unlike uh, that, um, yours, Belinda, the crow mother with her eggs, with the, the, the sort of dark cavities on, t on either side of the beak. Is it meant to be butterfly-ish? Uh, I don't remember having that in my imagination. Uh, no, I, I, I think these are her wings, um, truncated, although they're truncated. Sometimes the energy, no matter how large I work, and these are not terribly large, I, I've never worked terribly large, but they, the energy just very often shoots beyond the, the, the immediate frame of reference. Uh -huh. And some people ask me if these are breasts, but they, I, I have no memory of them consciously, you know, of my consciously making them breasts. I, I think it's just the energy flowing down from her eyes. In the image before, Gwen saw a badger. Oh, let's go back. Badger? Mm -hmm. you, you just the bottom part of the, the body of the moth as a nose. Yes. This is a nose? Yes. Yes. And then you go to the yes. two black, you see the eyes. Oh, oh my gosh. And his yes. ears. Oh. And if you look at the two things just below the nose as the digging. The oh my God, how amazing. I've never seen that before. Badger got in there. See, Badger and Coyote always like to be together. Quinn, how amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Mm. That's cool. <laughs> At first I thought it was a wolf, but it's not. It's uh, yeah, yeah, really. Wow. Sneaky guy. 